We are continuing with the Kansas Journey, Chapter 6. We are beginning on page 126 with the story of Abby Bright. We see a photograph of Abby. The caption to the photo says, Abby Bright was born in 1848. She was not a typical young woman as Abby chose to travel to Kansas on her own. Yet her story is similar to many other families that moved west after the Civil War. The Story of Abby Bright Abby Bright was born on her parents' farm in Pennsylvania. She grew up with three brothers and three sisters. By the time she was 12, the nation was in turmoil. With the outbreak of the Civil War, all three of Abby's brothers enlisted in the Union Army. Two were wounded, and the third became seriously ill. But all survived. The four girls spent their time helping their mother with her hospital aid work. At 15, Abby enrolled in a nearby college and soon began a teaching career. By the time she was 20 years old, she was making $16 a month for a three-month school year. Two of Abby's brothers had moved west, one to Indiana and the other to Kansas. Abby wanted to see the west. We are now on Abby Comes to Kansas. In April 1871, Abby wrote a letter to her brother Philip. Philip was living on a claim near Clearwater, close to Wichita. The letter informed him that Abby was coming to Kansas. A week later, without knowing if the letter had ever reached him, Abby set out for Kansas. Alone and full of adventure, she traveled by train at first. Arriving in Kansas City at 8 a.m., Abby prepared to change trains. In Topeka, she changed trains again, heading south towards Emporia. It was 6.20 p.m. when she finally reached the end of the line at Cottonwood. Abby gathered her belongings and crossed the track to the hotel in Cottonwood Falls a mile away. The hotel clerk put her in a room with another young woman who had arrived on an earlier train. The two women were strangers, but they soon became acquainted. Afraid they would miss the morning stage, the two young women kept the lamp burning all night. Abby was up in time to enjoy breakfast, her first full meal since leaving Indiana. By 5.30 a.m., there were two stagecoaches waiting for passengers. Each was pulled by a team of four horses. Abby and the two other women were given the back seat of one of the coaches. It was pretty crowded. Now we were at stagecoach ride. Soon they were off. Every 10 or 12 miles they stopped to change horses. The ride was rough. Every once in a while, Abby's head would bang against the top of the stage. When the ride became exceedingly difficult, the driver would yell out, Make yourself firm! Upon hearing his cry, Abby would grab onto the side of the stage to keep from getting hurt. At each stop, passengers departed from El Dorado to Augusta. There was only one large stagecoach pulled by... Excuse me, I'm going to begin that paragraph again. At each stop, passengers departed. From El Dorado to Augusta, there was only one large stagecoach pulled by six horses. Fifteen passengers were on board, and Abby was the only woman. After the stage passed Augusta, they had to cross the Whitewater River. Abby had never experienced anything like it before. The recent rains had made the water of the river deep and water came pouring into the coach, soaking her skirt. Okay, here's a picture of a stagecoach being pulled by the four horses. The caption tells us, perhaps Abby rode in a stagecoach like this one. 
The sketches by Kansas artist Albert T. Reed. Now we are beginning page 127. Arriving in Wichita. After crossing the river, the passengers rode for a long time, seeing nothing but prairie. Finally, the lights of Wichita appeared in the distance. Abby got off at the first stop, not knowing if she was in the right place. She wondered how and when she would see her brother. The clerk at the nearby hotel told Abby her brother's place was still 20 miles away along the Niniscaw River. Abby took a room and slept through the night. The next morning, she discovered the letter she had sent her brother sat unopened at the Wichita post office. It was suddenly clear to Abby that Philip would not be coming for her since he had no idea she had made the journey. Abby decided to take matters into her own hands and hired a young boy to drive her to the Niniska River. A pair of mules pulled the wagon open as it crossed more prairie and more streams. There were few houses on the prairie, but Abby delighted in watching the prairie dogs. The driver stopped at a supply house to ask about Abby's brother. The owner told Abby her brother's claim was across the river and about two miles up. But he warned her the river was too high to cross that day. He suggested she stay with his wife and directed her to a small dugout. The man's wife was delighted to see Abby, for she had not seen another woman to talk to in some weeks. In the morning, Abby was excited to see they were taking wagons across the river, one at a time. One of the men offered to take Abby in his wagon. As they reached the other side of the river, the driver took Abby to a log cabin that served as a frontier store. The driver and the storekeeper convinced Abby she could not walk the two miles to her brother's place. In an act of kindness, the storekeeper gave Abby a pony to ride. Abby's excitement grew as she pulled herself onto the pony. She had only to ride north a little while and go around a strip of trees. She had come so far. Soon she would see her brother. How do we know this? We know a great deal about Abby Bright's experiences in Kansas because she left a detailed diary. Why do you think Abby kept a diary? Do you think she knew that more than 100 years later, people would be reading about her experiences? The following, the following excerpt from her diary is dated May 8, 1871. Abby had decided to stay in Kansas and take a claim in her own name, near that of her brother. She writes about preparing the land to grow a garden. In this excerpt, she talks about two ways to prepare the land. What tools are used for each method? How are the settlers obtaining food before their gardens have grown? Here is the diary reading. Philip has broken some, broken some land and planted corn. He and some men have selected my claim, and when he goes to Wichita, he will file on it. Then no one can file on the same land. He selected a suitable place and plowed it for a garden. Not having a harrow, he hitched the oxen to big brush and dragged it back and forth until it was well raked. I have no hoe yet, but with the help of a stick, I have managed to plant a number of seed. I hope they will grow. One day, when going to the garden, I saw three antelopes and a coyote. There are three deer around. The men see them, and I see their tracks in my garden. 
there is a herd of buffalo twenty miles out. The boys have promised to take me along when they go again. The last time they were out, they brought in a lot of meat, and that is what we are using now. Provision is scarce. Potatoes, three dollars a bushel. The railroad, one hundred miles away, and the men on claims raising their first crop. Native cattle are very scarce, and the Texas cows are so wild they cannot be milked. Nevertheless, I get along very well and will stay here until I get tired. There is a Scotchman living across the river, a Mr. Ross. He was telling me that this is such a healthy country. If they want to start a graveyard, they would have to shoot someone. They have been breaking sod near here with yoke of oxen. One man drives, one plows, and one follows with an axe. He chops into the upturned sod and drops corn in the cut, puts his foot on the place, and takes a step and repeats. I will watch that piece and see what it amounts to. We live on buffalo, fish, bread, molasses, and coffee. All have good appetites. I don't drink coffee, but we have good water. Adapting to the plains, Western Kansas presented new challenges to settlers. Trees could not be found in Eastern Kansas, but there were not many in the West. The amount of water found in rivers and streams varied from season to season. And year to year, the short grasslands of the West were harder to plow, but settlers on the plains adapted to the environment. Hardships. The economic cycles of the nation affected Kansas settlers. During the late 1800s, there were times when the economy went into a depression, and times when the economy was healthy. These economic cycles affected all Americans, but they were particularly hard on settlers who were trying to start a new life. Periods of drought made it very difficult to grow crops, just as devastating as lack of rain were other harsh weather conditions such as blizzards. In some years, grasshoppers were more than a nuisance, invading the plains in large numbers. It seemed like nature was working against the settlers. If they could not successfully grow crops, then they had little chance of economic survival. Adaptation: Settlers on the plains found new ways of doing things to survive. When wood was not available to build houses, the settlers used earth to create shelters. And here we see some photos. During a ten-year period in the late 1800s, American use of barbed wire went from 300 tons to 130,000 tons as settlers moved west. This picture shows a sod house. These settlers are living in a sod house in Lane County. Sod was cut into bricks to build the house. Most of sod houses had roofs made of wood and paper covered by a layer of sod. We continue with page one hundred twenty-nine. Some lived in dugouts and others in sod houses. The lack of wood in western Kansas also created a shortage of fuels. Some settlers used bundled hay or corn cobs for fuel. People soon discovered that dried manure from buffaloes and cows would make a good fire. These were called buffalo chips or cow chips. The lack of trees created another challenge. 
People needed fences to keep livestock contained. It was too expensive to bring lumber in from the east just to build a fence. The invention of barbed wire had a big impact on settlers in western Kansas. Barbed wire was fairly inexpensive, lasted a long time, and was easily connected to fence posts. In much of the state, wooden fence posts were used, but in the central portion of Kansas, limestone fence posts became common. The lack of surface water also prevented, presented a challenge for settlers. To tap into underground water, settlers dug deep wells. They often used windmills to pull the water to the surface. The windmills supplied drinking water for both humans and animals. Some windmills also provided water for irrigation. People pumped groundwater into a pond. From there, the water went through ditches to reach thirsty crops. Windmill irrigation only worked on small farms. Above the picture, it tells us, in southwest Kansas, settlers used the ever-present wind to pull water out of the ground. Beginning in the 1880s, Kansas was home to 50 different companies that manufactured windmills. We saw a picture of a windmill on the previous page. This famous photograph was taken near Lakin in 1893. Ada McCall and her brother Bert are gathering buffalo chips for fuel. Their mother took this photograph. Bert is wearing a dress, which was common for both young boys and girls. Gathering Chips Early settlers had to get over any disgust they might have had toward handling buffalo or cow chips. Fuel was a necessity. And without anything else to burn, gathering chips became important work. The newspaper editor of the Perlat Call in Meade County explained it this way on April 15, 1879. Most of us burn chips. Buffalo chips, we call them. These chips make a tolerable fair fire, but of course burn out very rapidly. Consequently, to keep up a good fire, you must be continually poking the chips in and taking the ashes out. Still, we feel very thankful for even this fuel. It was comical to see how gingerly our wives handled these chips at first. They commenced by picking them up between two sticks or with a poker. Soon they used a rag and then a corner of their apron. Finally, growing hardened, a wash after handling them was sufficient. And now? Now it is out of the bread, into the chips, and back again, and not even a dust of the hands.